By golly, I am. And <laughs> incidentally, which version of Don't Fear the Reaper was that? That did not even sound like Blue Oyster Cult. And that was really? They yeah, what more, version was it? They needed more know. cowbell, in my opinion. <laughs> more cow, more cowbell. Definitely more cowbell. cowbell. There's, <laughs> there's no end. There's no limit to the cowbell that can be added <laughs> to everything. Dessert <laughs> toppings, mm. and all of your meals, and of course... All of your sound recordings require more <laughs> cowbell, but no, it really didn't. There was something odd about it, a little bit off. No, I didn't think it was. I thought it was the cover. Am I wrong, Chris? I think it no, was the cover. It was uh, definitely blue, blue oyster cult. Oh, it was. Oh, yeah. I, Just a different I, version I, I of some think. kind, I guess. Was it, it was alive. alive? I mean, that was, was definitely not the original. Agents no. of Fortune album version, I assure you, because I'm my goodness, right I played that um, <laughs> thousands of times, and I learned the song on guitar. Even the guitar solo didn't sound exactly right. It was close, but not exactly right. It is uh, remastered. It's a remastered version. Huh. Okay. Interesting. Well, hi. How are you guys? Wonderful. <laughs> How are oh, you? Good. Good. This is, and I'm not exaggerating, my 21st radio interview today. Nice. Congrats. <laughs> Very good. Yeah. <laughs> the other <laughs> ones were were short. You know, it was the it was the uh, classic radio satellite tour via phone. But oh my God, after a while, like, who am I talking to? What am I talking about? Did I already answer this question? I swear to God, I already answered this question. No, that was the last interview, you dumbass. <laughs> oh, that's great. So this is a more relaxed venue, I can tell. Oh yes. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. absolutely. Yep. <laughs> Absolutely. We're gonna take a break now. Play a song. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we had John B. Wells on. He he made a similar comment. He 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 mentioned that we were a lot lot more laid back. It's like yes, we are very laid back here. It's well, you know, be we've been play. doing a show. We've been doing the America's Most Haunted show on good old Blog Talk Radio. I heard you complaining about the <laughs> yeah. the equipment or the software or whatever's. Whatever's going wrong at the moment. Uh, but, yeah, we started that back in uh, July of 12. I was actually one of the almost original, I mean, within months of of the launch of Blog Talk Radio, you know, way back years and years and years and years ago when I ran Blog Critics. And I was on for several years and then had to step away. A bunch of other things came on. But we've been back on, or I've been back on since 12, and uh, we did a show, you know, essentially every week for over two years. We've been taking a little break from it now because we're going to change the format. It it seems the writing is on the wall that uh, we have to shift over to a podcast format so that it's recorded and at least somewhat produced, right. so that it's somewhat professional. We've been told yeah. that is the wave of the future, and then yes. the raw... Um, you know, unedited, unproduced uh, interview show is going by the wayside. Apparently, I, I mean, I don't know if this is true, but I guess Uh-oh. it is. Apparently, Blog Talk Radio got dropped from yeah. iTunes. Rip. Hmm. Rip. And it was simply because there were too many shows that were too long, and the audio quality was, you know, just not there, which none of which is news, is it? No, it's absolutely not news. <laughs> We've dealt with a lot of crap with uh, yeah. Locked Up Radio. We, we've had issues as, as trying to even start up a show when the whole, all of Blog Talk Radio was down and we couldn't even do a show. Nobody could do a show. Anyone that was running a show that night, their show just stopped. So, You know what happened? <laughs> we, I had a show, and it just we, our show has, has been, like I said, we've been on a bit of a break here for about... I don't know what it's been, a month, maybe. Maybe it's even been six weeks because we just had so much going on with the release of the book, America's Most Haunted, incidentally, is what it's called. So we've had all this promo stuff associated with that, which is great. We're super happy about it, but it's been very, 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 very busy time. Um, anyway, the show has been, you know, for two years, it's been on Tuesday nights at uh, 9 o'clock, and it just happened that this last year, 
Christmas Eve <laughs> was was on a Tuesday night. And so I'm doing the show because it was already scheduled way in advance. I, I don't think I noticed that, the, you know, hey, that's December 24th. That's Christmas Eve. So we're, I'm on, I'm doing the interview, we're like halfway through maybe, we're just chatting away, everything's great, everything goes totally dead. And because mm-hmm. it's Christmas Eve, there isn't even anyone on the helpline. I no, mean, we geez. were just left to our own devices, and that was it. That was the end of the show, you're done. <laughs> it's Christmas Eve, see ya. Yeah, it does not surprise me one bit. The only way I've ever No, been we've had similar... Yeah, the only way I've ever been able to really contact them was through their Twitter page. And that night that it happened, they were getting blown right up on their Twitter page. So we figured out that it wasn't just because we thought it was just our end. I thought I sure. made something up. No, yeah, it was the, the whole entire system was down. They got well. Some, you got to remember, got... it's all it's all based on the phone, right? So things go wrong with phone lines, and things go wrong with big blocks of them, and you can imagine how many lines they have coming in, you know, a line for every show, right? And right. Uh, and then it's all being fed into some kind of, you know, central server. So, I mean, it doesn't take that much for things to get really screwed up. I don't blame them for that. I mean, I'm, I'm actually amazed and impressed how often things do work and how relatively yeah. smooth it is. And I got to tell you, in, in, in defense of Blog Talk Radio, the changes, the improvements across the board, I mean, improvements in every possible category from when I left. Remember, I, you know, when I said I was on for a few years at the beginning and then I was gone for a while. But when by the time I came back in July of 12, uh, it had improved amazingly. You know, those early days, wow, there were a lot of issues. Because it is complicated and it, it is difficult. And, you know, so uh, I was told they are working really hard on a brand new, uh, you know, audio, HD audio format. Oh, wow. And the, when they're eventually finished with that, you know, they didn't know when it was going to be because you can imagine that is complicated. And yeah. uh, involves a lot of coding and a lot of changes and all that. But when that is back up and running, or, you know, and people are able to avail themselves of HD audio, that really will help a lot, and it, it should make a huge difference. It's. I think the main thing is it's not even the the raw, unedited interview format. I don't think that's the problem because that can be really interesting and, and absorbing and you get to hear conversations rather than just these boom, 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 you know, sound bites that uh, basically that's what I was doing this morning, you know. We're on maybe 10 minutes, maybe 15 minutes on each of those radio appearances and you can't say a whole lot in that period of time. You certainly can't get to know anyone very well. Oh, no way. You don't get no any way. background on them. So I do think moving to the HD audio, you know, and making everything sound good, as long as people use the right kind of phone, that's a whole other issue. You know, you get people calling in on cell phones or really crappy Skype, although I've actually heard some good Skype lately, too. I think they've improved a lot also. And it, there's there's so many variables, but by the time they do get that in, I think – that things will really sound good, and it'll make a huge difference, and uh, and hopefully they'll kind of come back in the good graces of the various kind of podcast outlets that have said, no, you know, we reject you. So um, you guys should start interviewing me now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, yeah, let's get going. Um, this is our cue, then. <laughs> uh, yeah, anyway, so... I guess we can start out. What um, you got this book that you that you guys wrote now? How how did you um, how did you guys you know how did you guys meet up and what what uh, what made you guys get together and 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 and, and do this anyway? Well, I'm a writer. I'm a media guy. I got a, a been I've been writing professionally one way or another, mostly about pop culture. Um, a lot of music, uh, TV, film, that kind of stuff. But I'm a little bit of everything too. You know, when you're on the internet, I've been on writing for the internet and publishing uh, uh, websites and producing websites and editing websites and writing for websites now since uh, since '02. And you know, when you're doing that, uh, you typically cover a pretty broad range. I've been involved with you know kind of wide ranging 
magazine shows. So so that's my background. I've been doing TV, radio, writing all of my adult life. What I hadn't really been doing is I hadn't had any particular involvement with the paranormal world for a long time. I had a number of experiences back when I was real young, as a teenager especially, and into my real early adulthood. I had several very vivid, strange, frightening uh, experiences. And I think what happened, this is all in retrospect, of course, I think what happened was as I was graduating college and getting a job and I was going to get married, I got married within a year after college and, you know, did all the, uh, did all that adult stuff, uh, at, at far too early an age as, as it turned out in retrospect, I think I just said, I don't want to deal with this stuff. This was subconsciously, of course, I'm going to turn it off. I will not be receptive to this. I won't see it even if it's around me. So I really, I had only maybe one kind of really, a vivid paranormal experience of note really over about the next 30 years. I mean, I just turned it off. And even that one was only a few years, you know, I was more like uh, in my later 20s when that happened, so it wasn't that long after. And really nothing happened after that until uh, I got back into it. So I had been writing and running websites and doing all that, uh, but again, it really had nothing to do in particular anyway with the paranormal. And then my wife and I were, were on vacation, and we were out in Arizona, and the kids were asleep, and we were just flipping through the dial, seeing what was on TV. And I stumbled, this was a few years ago, maybe four, maybe five at this point, years ago, and we just stumbled across a show called Ghost Adventures. And I just thought, my God, what's going on here? These people are actually seriously looking for ghosts in that <laughs> location. And not only are they looking for them, they're expecting to find them. And they are trying to document all this using various equipment and cameras and recorders. And I just was enthralled. I had no idea there was such a show out there. And then, of course, soon after that, I found all these other shows that were already going on. It had been preceded by Ghost Hunters, of course, and there were a number of other shows started finding them. So I was amazed because really what ultimately got me and hooked me were the implications. If any of this stuff is real, if any single one instance of this is real and of course i thought my experiences back when i was younger were certainly quite real i thought they were real anyway they felt real that's for sure so if any of this stuff is real that is actual proof that there is some form of life after death and my goodness isn't that the ultimate question that mankind that people have been asking since since they started sure. asking questions tens of thousands of years ago, maybe more. So that, for me, is what really underlies my fascination. I think the process is interesting. I enjoy seeing the procedure. Uh, you know, I, I like the experience. I love the history aspect of it. But really what, what has held me and, and made me want to spend this much time and effort and uh you know this is ongoing we have we're not stopping now just because the book is out um it, it's it's that underlying kind of metaphysical aspect that hey this really is very powerful and meaningful if even just one of these instances is real so i mean that's my background the way i met teresa was i started covering all these shows i'm I'm reviewing the shows. I'm I'm writing up, uh, you know, descriptions of the episodes. I started interviewing all the different stars and uh, writing those up and really enjoyed it. thought it was interesting. thought that was a really fascinating group of people, a lot of different ideas, but obviously they all have, you know, some form of, of belief in the paranormal. And those stories did really, really well. Uh, at that point, I was writing and, and running the Morton Report, was the name of, of that site. And uh, the paranormal interviews and the paranormal related stories did uh, about the best of, of anything, of any kind of story that we were publishing. Those are the ones that got the most traffic, got the most comments, got the most interest and attention. So, you know, me being a mercenary, I said, wow. Not only am I really interested in this, but 
it's bringing in great traffic. So I'm going to uh, pursue this and continue on with it. It's a win-win situation. So I was watching a show that was only on for one season. It was called Paranormal Challenge, and it was produced, exec produced, and hosted by Zach Baggins of uh, Ghost Adventures. And what they did is they took two teams, two paranormal investigation teams, and pitted them against each other in a competition at various super haunts, really iconic locations throughout the country. They were down at Waverly Hills for their episode, Teresa's, and her team is called the Haunted Housewives, and they are based right here in the Cleveland area where I am. So I said, aha, you know, here's someone, they were really interesting, they did a good job, they were, they were charismatic, and they won uh, their episode down at Waverly Hills. So I just contacted her, I said, hey, you know, I'm a writer, I'm here in Cleveland, uh, I would like to interview you. Did that. They invited us to come along, my wife and I, to come along with them on a uh, on a hunt, on an investigation. I thought that was fascinating. We even collected a little bit of evidence. We had a really, really creepy laugh uh, that was recorded on the digital recorder, and I thought that was amazing. Cool stuff. And uh, they put up the uh, the <coughs> matrix of the uh, the laser. They put up the laser grid and something very, very clearly went through there, broke that, you know, where you can see it, where it's interrupted. The beams are interrupted, and there was no, uh, you know, there's no human uh, explanation, although it was very much a human form. So so that began the the process. I was eager to do another book. I hadn't written a book since way back in 1999, and a lot. Well. I really I missed being able to give something time and attention and thought everything on the internet is so quick and so we figured hey let's uh, let's pull together the fact that teresa's been doing these investigations really her whole life and she's absolutely committed to it and she has tons and tons and tons of experience i have the media background i have the writing uh, ability let's uh, put it all together and that's what we did that's what america's most haunted is it's the 10 well, well, you got it. I guess, Chris, you said you got a copy of it. It's the 10 most haunted public or semi-public locations in the United States. So, so you I will actually, now stop talking, and you no. may ask another question. <laughs> no, we, we like it when you're talking. So, so when, So when you're doing this, are you actually participating in this, or are you just writing about it? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, once we began the process, then, uh, you know, a lot of the tales in the book certainly are experiences that Teresa had had previous, you know, prior in her life to when we started working on this. So she she had, the, you know, she had a back catalog of stories, in other words. So, of course, she wrote all those up. Um, you know, I, I um, kind of edited things, and, and uh, I reworked a lot of the stuff, and then I did a lot of the background, a lot of the historical background, kind of wrote up, uh, you know, what we had learned from investigations. But yeah, once we got started, I did go along. We went, I went to the Knickerbocker, I went to the Ohio State Reformatory, I went to Bobby Mackey's, I have previously been to the Stanley myself, I have been to the Queen Mary in fact, when I, when I was talking a little bit earlier about that one vivid paranormal experience that I did have after uh, I uh, after my you know made the decision that I that I was going to turn that stuff off, and again that wasn't a conscious decision. That was something that that I'm just speculating that I did uh, subconsciously within myself. But on the Queen Mary, uh, I was DJing in those days all through the 80s. I was one of the one of the had one of the bigger mobile and DJ um mobile and club DJ companies in Southern California. So we did all kinds of parties, did a lot of college parties and Queen Mary's always been very popular with the various fraternities and sororities in Southern California to go and have their formals at. So I was working my way through the ship when you're when you're uh when you're working there, which the DJ is, you got to come in through the rear. You know, you can't enter like normal people, and then you got to push your equipment through these tiny, narrow passageways and go up and down. It's just insane. It's so easy to get lost. Such an enormous ship. 
going up and down on these tiny little freight ele uh, elevators. So I finally get on the last one. It's the one that will take me to the deck I need to get to in order to set up to, to DJ this party in the Grand Salon, the famous Grand Salon in the Queen Mary. So I'm in this tiny little elevator, and I am not ever, I mean, I don't remember at any other time feeling particularly claustrophobic, but all of a sudden, it felt like the walls of this elevator were closing in on me, and my I started sweating and just feeling terrible. My field of vision started pixelating amazingly, weirdly. I mean, it felt like just, you know, all hell's breaking loose in this tiny little space. All of a sudden, behind me, while this is going on, I feel breath on the back of my neck, literally breathing and hearing breathing on the back of my neck. Well, there's no space in the thing. I turn around the wall. I, I hit my nose on the wall when I'm turning around behind me of, of the elevator, you know, and, and, and we're still going up. We're poking away very slow, old school elevator, and I'm in this tiny little space, and I'm freaking out, and I feel breathing on my neck, and then I hear a voice in my ear say, tight space, huh? Oh, my God, I about lost my freaking mind. When those doors opened, I blew out of there like a bat out of hell. And it was very hard to concentrate on my on my DJing the party for the rest of that evening, I assure you. Oh, man. So do you, do you guys spend the night at these places when you go? I have not done, you know, what I would call a full overnight yet. Uh, I've been up really, really late, you know, through into the wee hours of the morning. But I have not literally stayed, uh, you know, from dusk to dawn anywhere yet myself. I suppose that may be next on my on my uh, on the resume that I need to add. But I've I've been at, you know at locations for many hours and spent a lot of time and and done you know what I thought was pretty much all there was to do. I, we very very thoroughly now several times uh, have gone through the entire building from 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 the third floor well the second floor uh, which is now off limits to uh well to everyone at Bobby Mackey's down to the basement. So in other words there's three floors and we've been through those now several times and put in a lot of time at the crazily wildly bizarrely haunted Bobby Mackey's. Even if you discount kind of the whole theory about the portal to hell, the well down in the basement and kind of write that off because we didn't really find any particular evidence that uh, any of the stories regarding the the beheading of uh, poor Pearl Bryant, you know, in theory, the way the tale is told, her head was tossed down this well and they by Satan worshippers. We weren't able to prove any of that, although, of course, Pearl absolutely was murdered and her head was certainly cut off, but it was not there in that building or anywhere particularly near the building. It seems to have happened about a mile and a half to two miles away. And the only connection to Bobby Mackey's really is the fact that their coach, this happened in the very late 1800s, actually the road that they took did go by uh, the property that is now Bobby Mackey's. At that point, it was a um, slaughterhouse. and In fact, it was a shuttered slaughterhouse. It had been closed at that point. So uh, the whole thing is amazing but that, that the fact that uh, you know this isn't necessarily that hole in the in the basement of Bobby Mackey's isn't necessarily a portal to hell what it was was it was the drainage sluice for that original slaughterhouse so there was still all kinds of crazy stuff going through there you know imagine how much blood and you know remnants and body parts of thousands and thousands of animals went through there I would not be surprised if you know some sort of energy lingers there. But uh, again, that doesn't change the fact that there's still all kinds of activity. So whether it's a portal to hell or not, whether well, I, Pearl's I hate to head cut, is there or not, but I hate uh, to cut you off. But when you said that the first time, the light flickered in here and it got a little cold. So do -do 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 -do. <laughs> cool. I love that. I planned that. I'm glad it went that way. That's awesome. Yeah. So, uh, wow. So, I, I, I was going to ask, I mean, do you get, like, creeped out? Because I can, when there is a lot of activity going on in, in a house, I will sense that. I'm, 
I, I just, and I get a little creeped out, and I just don't want to be in that house. That's just the the sense that I get, that I just want to leave. Yeah, kind of like when you said you were on the elevator. Yeah, Not that, that was, yeah. wow, that was super negative. The, I, I don't have, I haven't really thus far, you know, since I have re-entered the field, so to speak, I haven't had anything happen that was really intensely negative. I haven't had that really, really vivid, bad feeling where you feel sick to your stomach. I mean, I know what you're talking about. You know, you feel sick to your stomach. Just everything feels wrong. It just feels like a very oppressive, heavy atmosphere. I haven't had really that sense, at least not strongly, uh, since I kind of re-entered the field. I think part of it is, to be honest, while I have clearly kind of reopened myself up a certain extent, I think I've still maybe only gone halfway. You know, I think I still have a lot of hesitation in there. Because, like I said, I had some things happen that were very, very intense and very strange. If you'd like, I'd be happy to to recount <laughs> one or more oh, of those experiences. Those were, you know, really bizarre. And it's like, wow, do I really want to... Ha- go through that again at this stage of my life uh, but oh. but I also understand I, is, I, I'm not sure you know is it legit to only open yourself up halfway I don't know I mean I guess it is I guess whatever you do you do and you do what you have to do to get by you know we've talked through through doing our radio show or just interviews for the website or whatever, we've talked to a lot of these people who are really, you know, kind of some of the world's best known and, and most successful uh, sensitives, you know, like Amy Allen of the Dead Files. I mean, she sees dead people everywhere, and they are trying to talk to her all the time. And it has taken her kind of her whole life to figure out how to filter it a little bit, you know, to get a little bit of frickin' sleep from time to time. But, man, I wouldn't want to live that way. How awful would that be? I mean, it, it's almost like, you know, the two worlds just kind of blend together, and you can't even tell anymore the difference between them. I just wouldn't want that kind of distraction or that kind of pressure I have a hard enough time, you know, living in the real world and staying staying focused on the things that I need to do without a bunch of dead people talking to me all the time. I couldn't even imagine. Not cool. Yeah. I only had that experience um, as far as being, um, uh, I don't want to say assaulted. I was assaulted a couple of times, but but like uh, followed around and just almost tormented for about a year about one year of my life, I think it was about 2001. Was it a 2001? Yeah, uh, no, 2000. It was 2000. Starting January 31st, uh, 1999, uh, we we messed with a Ouija board in the basement. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and that was a creepy experience, but the next day was even creepier. It tormented my sister, and uh, that was a scary experience, and... It just didn't stop. It messed with her for about a month, and then when it was done with her, it messed with me and followed me wherever I went. And I had some very scary experiences. Like one time, uh, the uh, go ahead, tell me. I, I'd love to it, hear. That's, that's it was, terrible. I'm sorry you had to go. No, through no, that. It, it was uh, it was a crazy time in my life at that point. My kidneys were failing. Um, I was kind of hanging out with the wrong crowd. I was living in Paulsboro, New Jersey, South Jersey pretty close to Philadelphia, and it was daytime, and I had about three or four friends uh, at the house I was living at, and one moment they were awake, and I was like playing, you know, the Tony Hawk's uh, skateboarding game or whatever on the PlayStation, whatever it was, Right. And, and all of a sudden I like broke the, you know, the house record and got like twice as much as I ever had before, and it was kind of crazy, and I look around and I'm like, I was like, check that out. Like, did you see that? And everybody was asleep. And I didn't think much of it then. I didn't really think, like, well, that's odd. They're asleep. They were just asleep. And then all of a sudden, the, the uh, radio turned on, but it was on CD player mode. And this uh, this this guy was just, uh, th- this guy was talking on it, on the radio, to me, through the radio. And it was on real loud. 
and I was freaking out, and I was like, I, and I was just terrified, and I was trying to wake everyone up. I was I was literally shaking them almost violently to wake them up, and no one would wake up. It was so scary. It was like I I kind of felt like it was almost uh, like an abduction experience, you know. Do you think you were fully awake? I mean, could you have been? Oh, I was kind awake. Of, you were fully awake when this oh, was happening. Yeah. Oh yeah, hundred percent awake. Wow. Oh yeah. oh yeah. That is obviously mortifying. My yeah. goodness. Yeah. I mean, involving you know electronic equipment. I mean, were your friends just just playing asleep, or were they kind of they were off little... in some other dimension or something? Right. They, they were literally. Two of them were on the couch, and they were sitting up asleep with their heads back. Oh, no, that's weirder still. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm I, I'm getting chills thinking and talking about it right now. That that had to be the most terrifying experience probably of my life. Wow. Jeff, wow. we're going uh, to interrupt you. We're, mm-hmm. uh, we're going to be getting to Teresa here. So, Excellent. Eric, I wanted to... I wanted to ask you, are you going to be staying on and listening, or do you want to uh, call back in after? Uh, I'm going to take a little we break. Um, sure. A- after my – just what a day I've had. After that radio tour <laughs> this morning, less than one minute later, after I finished my last interview, the timing couldn't have been mm-hmm. better, the power went out. Our power was out for six hours today. Oh, wow. After that final <laughs> – Radio episode, so I I had a bunch of stuff that I had to get done, didn't get done, you know, that didn't, and I'm sure. still behind. I'm I'm just gonna go take a little break, do a couple things, mm-hmm. and uh, let Teresa talk because she is wonderful in her own right. And then I'll come back on and we'll both blab away. <laughs> I mean, it, it it really can be confusing at times. So, Teresa, I mean, uh, would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself? You, I mean, it sounds like you have a very interesting job. I mean, how maybe how you got started in this and uh, what attracts you to it and perhaps um, where you see it going? Well... I am a uh, paranormal investigator. Uh, I, I prefer the term parahistorian over ghost hunter, but, you know, it's just a matter of semantics. You can call, call yourself whatever you want. I've been interested in the paranormal since I was a child, but when I was young, and I won't say how many decades ago that was, um, but it wasn't something that you could talk about freely. I mean, people thought you were a loony if you said you believed in ghosts unless you were a child. So it was kind of something that you kept hush-hush. It was... For children, it was just stories, and uh, for me, it was it was reality. It was real life, so I found it fascinating. And then luckily, with the Internet, I kind of discovered that there were many people like me out there that believed in ghosts and people that actually went hunting for ghosts, you know, outside of the, the, paras- the, the parapsychologist and these uh, great psychics that I had read all about, you know, that there were other people like me that were interested in this and actually went looking for ghosts. And then there was the reality television boom, and the first ghost hunting show came on, and, you know, I was like, wow, there are lots of weirdos just like me. Mm. So it was very comforting. Okay. So um, have you been listening to the show uh, as far as, like, the last 15, 20 minutes goes? Yeah, I've heard, I've heard like, the last 25 minutes or so. I heard uh, Eric talking. Okay. So what do you think about the whole Ouija board thing? People... I... Uh, yeah. You know, the Ouija board is a is, – I personally, and I used to believe that the Ouija board was it was something evil and it was a cult and it was dangerous, and I actually had an experience when I was younger that was very scary and terrifying. But now that I've been doing this for more than a decade as a serious, well, profession, I guess you could say, um, I don't believe that the Ouija board is any different than any other tool that we use in the paranormal. It's no different than dowsing rods or your voice recorder, or your camera, or even your flashlight. It's just a tool. And that being said, the tool is in how you use it and what your intentions are. Mm. Um, I use Ouija boards all the time. I don't recommend them for children. I don't recommend Mm. them for people who have compromised physical or mental uh, illnesses or people who are emotionally disturbed. I think that you're not prepared for 
what you might use and what you might bring into your world using a Ouija board, but the same thing can be said for a voice recorder. It's just a tool. It's, it's what your intention is and how you use it. I think the Ouija board has a bad name, but, you know, I did have a bad experience, but I was inexperienced and I was not ready for anything paranormal to happen to me at that time. And I paid okay. the price. Mm-hmm. So you mentioned do, a little... Do you, while. Yeah, go ahead, Mark. Do you mind getting into it at all? Or do you mind... Uh, well, it was... I was, a, I was a young girl. I was probably maybe 12, maybe 13, but I don't think I was quite a teenager yet. And I was using the Ouija board with my cousins, and, um, you know, we had heard all about it and heard it was this great way to talk to evil spirits. And But, of course, being a 12-year-old girl, we were asking things like, does Bobby Smith like me or... You know, who's going to win the baseball game? Silly things that children ask. And and it seemed when we were asking questions that our questions weren't being answered. Instead, it was, there seemed to be a conversation happening, not answering our questions. The first couple questions were answered, and then it seemed like it was kind of taking over the conversation. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and it said that someone in my family was going to die. And that terrified me, and it terrified my cousins, and it terrified all of us. And within a week, somebody in my family did die. Mm. And, of course, I immediately thought it was the Ouija board, and I thought something, it was a horrible experience. I started having nightmares. And it was bad, and I totally blamed the Ouija board, and I was told by my parents that that's what I get for messing with that, and that the evil spirit that, that I was speaking to an easy board, and the Ouija board actually had something to do with the death in my family, and I believe this. <laughs> So I was really terrified of it. But you know what? I mean, when I look back and think about it, could have been my older cousin trying to scare us, pushing right. the planchette around. You don't know. So, right. But I, I shouldn't have been using it at that time. I was in no shape to be using a Ouija board. No, I hear you. Mm-hmm. Okay. So how has the... I mean, you mentioned about how the uh, how the Internet is bringing people out and everything so, where they feel more open. How about uh, your friends in your personal life? Are you noticing that recently, for instance, uh, people are more open the, to the idea and more open to talking about it? Well, I, I think that people are. I think that in the last 10 years, there's been a huge jump in uh, being able to speak about paranormal events and have it being accepted. Um, I think that the reality television has a lot to do with it. The Internet has a lot to do with it. And it's almost like it's kind of a cool thing to believe in ghosts. Um in one sense, I think that people in modern society are, they, they have this aura about them that they think they're too smart to believe in something supernatural or paranormal because science doesn't prove it and you have to take it on faith. But in the other sense, uh, there's people that say, well, so what? I want to believe in it. I've had these experiences. Millions of people have had them. And for me personally, I kind of surround myself with people who have the same belief system I do. So outside of maybe... Uh, my my kids, the, their parents, the, the friends of their their friends' parents that I deal with at school or maybe at sporting events, everyone in my life kind of believes what I believe. We're all kind of involved in the paranormal. I mean, because this is kind of not just a hobby for me. This is full time. Between the book and the ghost walk and the haunted housewives things that we do, that's the only kind of people I really surround myself with. So mm-hmm. we're all in the same boat. Okay. okay, sure. I I found that uh, most people have had experiences in the paranormal. Um, even growing up, uh, I mean, I'm only 34 now, but, uh, you know, 10, 15 years ago, most people that I've talked to did have some strange experience or, or they knew someone close to them that did. And uh, sometimes you can even see when they're talking about it, the hair stand, standing up on their arm because they're, like, creeped out. And... Uh, so I guess my question is, why hasn't science proven it by now? You would think the scientific community would come out and say there's something to it. I mean, what's the deal there? How come they haven't? Well, I think that depends on, on who you're who you're asking. Um, and, and that's kind of like saying, why hasn't science proved God? And I think that, I, again, it just depends on who you're asking. I don't think that there really is much scientific proof to be to be gotten right now in the paranormal and these ghost hunters these people who do this who say they're they're doing science and they they work in the scientific method and everything they do in an investigation is science-based 
that's a bunch of bull. There's nothing scientific about what we do. We cannot pr- reproduce these results in a controlled setting. Right. We can't have the same results happen. There's nothing scientific about it. What we do use is technology. We are using different devices and electronics to help us detect anomalies in the environment and to record these experiences when we can. But as far as science goes, when you think about pure science and the scientific method, we're not using it. So for science to be able to prove this, I don't think it's going to happen, not for a long time, if ever. But Mm -hmm. I do think that science will be able to, at some point, prove certain aspects of things that we now call paranormal that they may have a scientific explanation for. I think the main thing would be probably some sort of residual energy left over by the human body when the human body dies, Mm -hmm. whether Mm -hmm. that be, we call that now a soul or your personality or your essence or your aura, whatever we call it now, science may have another term for it in 10, 20, 30 years. And this might be proven, just like we proved germ theory and that the earth is not flat and that the moon is not made of cheese. So the scientific community will be able to prove certain aspects of it eventually, but but not all of it. I think we're very far from ever proving to beyond a reasonable doubt to everyone in the world that ghosts exist. I mean, think about this. Some people don't even believe we've put a man on the moon. How are we right. going to prove that ghosts exist to them? Right. Right, right, right. Very interesting. Okay, so um, so that, was gonna, that answered my next question, which was going to be if it's not ghosts, uh, what else could it be? And uh, it was very, I, I really liked that, the whole residual energy left over. That's, mm. that's a cool theory. And uh, I'm definitely going to say that could possibly it have you ever heard the theory that they these be they could actually be beings that like some other uh, dimensional beings that are just mimicking the lives of people who were once alive they're just uh have you ever heard that i've heard different theories um maybe not quite exactly that one but but again think about that when you think about like quantum physics and i'm not a scientist and i don't know much about it but I know that there are theories that we live in one dimension, but there are many, many, many dimensions that are very similar to what we are, to what we're experiencing, but maybe slightly different. And maybe sometimes, in, in some way, our dimension interacts briefly with someone else's dimension. Maybe it is. It, it, maybe that's what's happening. Maybe. Uh, maybe who knows? Maybe it's aliens. Who knows what it could be? I mean, I think that there are so many different possibilities that we don't know. My personal belief is that ghosts, spirits, are the the remains, the essence of a person once living that is now passed on, that this is their way of communicating, but that's my personal belief. I'm not discounting that there could be something completely different, completely that has nothing to do with being a human that has died and come back in another form. So these interdimensional, these, these theories, I think, are fascinating. And that's something that science is working on, at least quantum physics and uh, mm-hmm. different areas like that. So oh, yeah. maybe they'll be the ones to prove something. Oh, yeah. With all, with, I think they said something like there's 12 dimensions or, or something or another. But, um, but that, what you just said is awesome because I, I often think to myself that on some other dimension, there's, life is being experienced. And I'm a I'm occasionally popping up in their dimension as a ghost. <laughs> yeah, think about that. What if you're the ghost? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. Oh yeah. Oh that it's it's a total mind job. It just completely you know that definitely comes to mind often. Like when I'm opening and closing cabinets, I'm thinking, did I just like freak someone out? <laughs> Some other <laughs> That's that's an amazing way to look at it. Like I love that movie, the the others, that Nicole Kidman movie where oh, yeah. they were the ghosts. I mean, think about that. How oh, clever is that? That and was a what creepy if, movie. Oof. Yeah, what if we're creeping the hell out of somebody right now and they're hearing mm-hmm. our voices and trying to capture our voices on recording devices? Yeah, that was a good movie, by the way. Wow. Awesome movie. One of my <laughs> favorites. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. And, and I, I, I have not spoken to many people. And in fact, I think you're the first person that I've ever spoken to that actually has seen that movie. So that's really? awesome. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God, I love it. It's really? a smart horror movie. I love that movie. Yeah. One of my oh. favorites. Yeah, yeah. And I'm not a big fan of horror movies, but that was a good one. Yeah. <laughs> How about that? Wow. I want to get Chris's opinion on the uh, 
on some of these things too. And he gets, I should have, I should have held some of the questions back until he came uh-huh. back. Definitely. Mm-hmm. Wow. Uh, we, we can come back. So, Teresa, have you ever performed um, some sort of exorcism, not not out of a person, but out of a home, like sent them off into the white light? Oh, yes, absolutely. I'm a ghost maid. Okay. No, no not nope. at all. You're not. <laughs> okay, you haven't. Okay. I have not. Um, I I think that, I and, I and again, my theories have changed. When I first used to investigate the paranormal, I used to try and help um, and I don't really know how I thought I could do this. I used to try and help people who had ghosts in their house get rid of their ghost. And um, I would try to send the ghost to the white light or cleanse the house. And I have done cleansings, but that's more of, of a, just an energy, like a positive negative energy type thing, not so much getting rid of a spirit. Um, I'm not a psychic, so I can't I can't really do that. I know that there are some psychics. I was just watching Marianne Winkowski today on TV who opened a portal in these people's house and sent this ghost to the white light. And the way I look at that now is like, that's kind of uh, crazy to think that she has the power to send a spirit away. Like, what is she, God? I mean, how how does she know she's doing that? I mean, I don't, I don't understand how people can say that. Now, that being said, I, I do try to help people. They say, look, we got a ghost. It's, it's scaring the kids. It's keeping it up. I can't get rid of them. I can't exercise them or clean them out of the house. But I can just, at least to my best ability, to try and communicate with this spirit and say, look, you're causing havoc. You're scaring the kids. Would you mind leaving, please? And ask them to leave, compel them to leave. But I can't chase them out. I can't clean them out. Um, negative energy can be cleaned out. I believe that is something that you can absolutely do. Anybody can do it very easily. But as far as getting rid of ghosts, um, maybe a good psychic can. I don't know. I'm not a psychic. Um, but I think it's more of asking them and, and compelling them, would you mind leaving? Because who am I to tell anybody what they should do with their life or their afterlife? Right. You need to leave. They're thinking, hey, this is my house. Right. You're the stranger in my right, house. Right, right. You know, like what if, like right now, like you just said, what if they thought we were the ghosts and they're trying right. to get rid of us and we're like, this is my house. What are you talking about? You get mm-hmm. out. So mm-hmm. I've heard actually once that uh, the best time for uh, uh, spirits to go into the white light is around Halloween, supposedly. How about oh, that? Oh, sure. Why not? Why not Easter Sunday at 3 p.m.? <laughs> I mean, who, 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 who decided this? You know, it's it's a, it's great for stories and, and who knows? Mm-hmm. Now, I... I I do think that there is a possibility that, especially on Halloween, just because of people's mindset, people's collective consciousness Mm -hmm. seems to be geared towards something more paranormal, more supernatural, Mm -hmm. that just because everyone's maybe thinking about it and Mm -hmm. collectively just maybe for one day believing in it, that maybe all that energy does kind of power the paranormal a little bit. So there might be something to that, but I don't believe in, like, Friday the 13th at midnight right. between 12 and 3 is dead time or whatever. Who's, what, if, what if you're in Europe? Then their time is different, so, you mm-hmm. know. Right, How can you right. say that? Who says that ghosts can tell time? Right. Some, yeah, exactly. I hear you. So, um, okay, so I guess, uh, I guess as far as, like, the white light bringing it about, I mean, if you can change the energies in a house, then you should be also be able to, I would think, because if the white light's already there, all you're doing is making them see it. I mean, it could it could be something like that. I mean, because one time, and I, because this is when I was pondering all this and, and really into it back in the day. It, w- it was about ten, fifteen years ago. I can't remember exactly when. I was. It was. It was around during the time of Halloween. And I went to this person's house who I've never been there before. And I just had uh, the sense that something, you know, someone was there. And I was walking around the house. And uh, and, and I had a visualization of, um, I, I could just see, like, not like holographic, but like, um, not like the normal ghost, like they're white, but like clear as day, almost what they were wearing and everything. I go upstairs and I saw a, a guy and, and a, a woman, and I, and I assumed they were married or something. Um, and they were, like, fighting, and, and the guy was, uh, like, throwing something into the fireplace or whatever. 
and and I got the sense I didn't see the third person, but I got a sense like there was like like a little girl around like watching or like uh, trying to hide from the steps. And I go downstairs and I ask the owner of the house because this is uh, like the night before Halloween and we were trick, uh, you know, uh, doing the whole when you go to those uh, what are they haunted houses and they try to scare you and everything. And I asked the owner, and he said, we've had a psychic here before, and they've said uh, similar things, etc. And and so on the way home, I just, um, okay, so I, I, have to, I have to go back a second here. With the whole quantum physics and everything, uh-huh. the, the idea is you can control the energies around you. You can do a lot more than that, I mean, supposedly. So what I was doing was I was... It's like a holographic uh, image. It's like every we're in a holographic universe, and if you want to mm-hmm. make something happen, you just visualize it happening. So it's like you you clear your mind, you clear your imag- you clear your mind and your imagination, your thoughts, and you visualize the house. And all you do is you visualize the white light, and supposedly that helps to encourage or influence it. And when I did that, as we were driving home, I wasn't even in the house. As I was driving home, driving home. I did that, and I just visualized them going up and in, into the light. I don't know if it actually worked or not, but I got the sensation that it did. But uh, but a few years later, I heard a crazy story, which makes me regret doing all of that. That um, the white light is actually coming from a device that's on the moon that traps souls. <laughs> Have you ever heard that before? I brought this up, I think, the other night on the show, actually, to the guest. Because we're talking about the moon. <laughs> no, I can honestly say I have never heard that. Yeah, it's um, creepy. <laughs> that is that is very unusual. I've never heard that. Uh, now, we, the, the moon aside, what you were saying about the white light, light and visualization, that is a technique that I use and that many people I know use um, as far as protecting themselves. Right. on an investigation to kind of shield yourself from negative energies, negative influences, or if you get scared. And I know that I have psychic friends that will kind of do that. They will help. They will tell us to imagine the white light, generate the white light, and this is what they supposedly use to help the spirit cross over or leave. But I've not heard anything about the moon. But, hey, man, I've heard <laughs> weird stuff, so who knows. <laughs> By golly, I am. And <laughs> incidentally, which version of Don't Fear the Reaper was that? That did not even sound like Blue Oyster Cult. And that was really? They yeah, what more, version was it? They needed more know. cowbell. In my opinion, more cowboy, more cowboy. definitely more, more cowboy. cowboy. There's, <laughs> there's no end. There's no limit to the cowbell that can be added <laughs> to everything. Dessert <laughs> toppings, mm. and all of your meals, and of course, all of your sound recordings require <laughs> more cowbell. But no, it really didn't. There was something odd about it, a little bit off. No, I didn't think it was. I thought it was the cover. Am I wrong, Chris? I think it no, was the cover. It was uh, definitely blue, blue oyster cult. Oh, it was. Oh, yeah. I, Just a different I, version I, I of some think. kind, I guess. Was it, it's it was live. I mean, that was definitely not the original Agents no. of Fortune album version. I assure you, because I'm my goodness, right I played that um, <laughs> thousands of times, and I learned the song on guitar. Even the guitar solo didn't sound exactly right. It was close, but not exactly right. It is uh, remastered. It's a remastered version. Huh. Okay. Interesting. Well, hi. How are you guys? Wonderful. <laughs> How are oh, you? Good. Good. This is, and I'm not exaggerating, my 21st radio interview today. Nice. Congrats. Nice. Very good. Yeah. <laughs> the <laughs> other ones were were short. You know, it was the it was the uh, classic radio satellite tour via phone. But, oh, my God, after a while, like, who am I talking to? What am I talking about? Did I already answer this question? I swear to God I already answered this question. No, that was the last interview, you dumbass. Uh, yeah. 
That's great. So this is a more relaxed venue, I can tell. Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. absolutely. Yep. <laughs> Absolutely. We're going to take a break now. Play a song. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we had John B. Wells on. He he made a similar comment. He he, he mentioned that we were a lot, lot more laid back. It's like, yes, we are very laid back here. It's well, you know, be we've been play. doing a show. We've been doing the America's Most Haunted show on good old blog talk radio. I heard you complaining about the, <laughs> yeah. the equipment or the software or whatever's Whatever's going wrong at the moment. Uh, but, yeah, we started that back in uh, July of 12. I was actually one of the almost original, I mean, within months of of the launch of Blog Talk Radio, you know, way back years and years and years and years ago when I ran Blog Critics. And I was on for several years and then had to step away. A bunch of other things came on. But we've been back on, or I've been back on since 12, and uh, we did a show, you know, essentially every week for over two years. We've been taking a little break from it now because we're going to change the format. It, it seems the writing is on the wall that uh, we have to shift over to a podcast format so that it's recorded and at least somewhat produced. Right. So that it's somewhat professional. We've been told yeah. that is the wave of the future and then yes. the raw... Um, you know, unedited, unproduced uh, interview show is going by the wayside. Apparently, I, I mean, I don't know if this is true, but I guess Uh-oh. it is. Apparently, Blog Talk Radio got dropped from yeah. iTunes. Rip. Rip. And it was simply because there were too many shows that were too long, and the audio quality was, you know, just not there, which none of which is news, is it? No, it's absolutely not news. We've dealt with a lot of crap with uh, yeah. Lock Talk Radio. We, we've had issues as, as trying to even start up a show when the whole, all of Blog Talk Radio was down and we couldn't even do a show. Nobody could do a show. Anyone that was running a show that night, their show just stopped. So, You know what happened? <laughs> we, I had a show, and it just we, our show has, has been, like I said, we've been on a bit of a break here for about... I don't know what it's been, a month, maybe. Maybe it's even been six weeks because we just had so much going on with the release of the book, America's Most Haunted, incidentally, is what it's called. So we've had all this promo stuff associated with that, which is great. We're super happy about it, but it's been very, 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 very busy time. Um, anyway, the show has been, you know, for two years, it's been on Tuesday nights at uh, 9 o'clock, and it just happened that this last year, Christmas Eve... <laughs> <laughs> was was on a Tuesday night. And so I'm doing the show because it was already scheduled way in advance. I, I don't think I noticed that, the, you know, hey, that's December 24th. And you get to hear conversations rather than just these boom, 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 you know, sound bites that uh, basically that's what I was doing this morning, you know. We are on maybe 10 minutes, maybe 15 minutes on each of those radio appearances, and you can't say a whole lot in that period of time. You certainly can't get to know anyone very well. Oh, no way. You don't get no any way. background on them. So I do think moving to the HD audio you know, and making everything sound good, as long as people use the right kind of phone, that's a whole other issue. You, know, you get people calling in on cell phones or really crappy Skype, although I've actually heard some good Skype lately, too. I think they've improved a lot also. and it, there's, there's so many variables, but by the time they do get that in, I think that things will really sound good. And it'll make a huge difference, and uh, and hopefully they'll kind of come back in the good graces of the various kind of podcast outlets that have said, no, you know, we reject you. So um, you guys should start interviewing me now. Uh, all right yeah let's get going um this is our cue then (laughs) uh yeah anyway so i guess we can start out what um you got this book that you that you guys wrote now how how did you um how did you guys you know how'd you guys meet up and what what uh what made you guys get together and then and, and and do this anyway well, I'm a writer. I'm a media guy. I got a, a been I've been writing professionally one way or another, mostly about pop culture, um a lot of music, uh, TV, film, that kind of stuff. But I'm a little bit of everything too, you know, when you're on the internet. I've been on 
writing for the internet and publishing uh, uh, websites and producing websites and editing websites and writing for websites now since uh, since o two and you know when you're doing that uh, you typically cover a pretty broad range i've been involved with you know kind of wide ranging magazine shows so so that's my background i've been doing tv radio writing all of my adult life what I hadn't really been doing is I hadn't had any particular involvement with the paranormal world for a long time. I had a number of experiences back when I was real young, as a teenager especially, and into my real early adulthood. I had several very vivid, strange, frightening uh, experiences. And I think what happened, this is all in retrospect, of course, I think what happened was as I was graduating college and getting a job and I was going to get married, I got married within a year after college and, you know, did all the, uh, did all that adult stuff, uh, at, at far too early an age as, as it turned out in retrospect, I think I just said, I don't want to deal with this stuff. This was subconsciously, of course, I'm going to turn it off. I will not be receptive to this. I won't see it even if it's around me. So I really, I had only maybe one kind of really, a vivid paranormal experience of note really over about the next 30 years. I mean, I just turned it off. And even that one was only a few years, you know, I was more like uh, in my later 20s when that happened, so it wasn't that long after. And really nothing happened after that until uh, I got back into it. So I had been writing and running websites and doing all that, uh, but again, it really had nothing to do in particular anyway with the paranormal. And then my wife and I were, were on vacation, and we were out in Arizona, and the kids were asleep, and we were just flipping through the dial, seeing what was on TV. And I stumbled, this was a few years ago, maybe four, maybe five at this point, years ago, and we just stumbled across a show called Ghost Adventures. And I just thought, my God, what's going on here? These people are actually seriously looking for ghosts in that location. And not only are they looking for them, they're expecting to find them. And they are trying to document all this using various equipment and cameras and recorders. And I just was enthralled. I had no idea there was such a show out there. And then, of course, soon after that, I found all these other shows that were already going on. It had been preceded by Ghost Hunters, of course, and there were a number of other shows started finding them. So I was amazed because really what ultimately got me and hooked me were the implications. If any of this stuff is real, if any single one instance of this is real and of course i thought my experiences back when i was younger were certainly quite real i thought they were real anyway they felt real that's for sure so if any of this stuff is real that is actual proof that there is some form of life after death and my goodness isn't that the ultimate question that mankind that people have been asking since since they started sure. asking questions, 10th, 4th, that's Christmas Eve. So <laughs> we're, I'm on, I'm doing the interview, we're like halfway through maybe, we're just chatting away, everything's great. Everything goes totally dead. And because mm-hmm. it's Christmas Eve, there isn't even anyone on the helpline. I no, mean, we geez. were just left to our own devices, and that was it. That was the end of the show, you're done. <laughs> it's Christmas <laughs> Eve, see ya. Yeah, it does not surprise me one bit. The only way I've ever no, been we've had similar. Yeah, the only way I've ever been able to really contact them was through their Twitter page. And that night that it happened, they were getting blown right up on their Twitter page. So we figured out that it wasn't just because we thought it was just our end. I thought I sure. made something up. No, yeah, it was the, the whole entire system was down. They got well. Some, you got to remember, got... it's all it's all based on the phone, right? So things go wrong with phone lines and things go wrong with big blocks of them and you can imagine how many lines they have coming in you know a line for every show right and uh and then it's all being fed into some kind of you know central server so i mean it doesn't take that much for things to get really screwed up i don't blame them for that i mean I'm, i'm actually amazed and impressed how often things do work and how relatively yeah. smooth it is. And I got to tell you, in, in in defense of Blog Talk Radio, the changes, the improvements across the board, I mean, improvements in every possible category, 
from when I left, remember, I, you know, when I said I was on for a few years at the beginning, and then I was gone for a while. But when, by the time I came back in July of twelve, uh, it had improved amazingly. You know, those early days, wow, there were a lot <laughs> of issues because it is complicated and it, it is difficult. And you know, so uh, I was told they are working really hard on a brand new, uh, you know, audio, HD audio format. Oh, wow. And the, when they're eventually finished with that, you know, they didn't know when it was going to be because you can imagine that is complicated and yeah. uh, involves a lot of coding and a lot of changes and all that. But when that is back up and running, or, you know, and people are able to avail themselves of HD audio, that really will help a lot. And it, it should make a huge difference. It's. I think the main thing is it's not even the the raw, unedited interview format. I don't think that's the problem because that can be really interesting and, and absorbing. 